I hate the children being taken away. The Democrats have to change their law. That's their law. The Democrats forced that law upon our nation. I hate it. But there's no law that says that families have to be separated at the border. The there's another way to go about it. The Democrats gave us the laws. Good morning and welcome to AM Joy. Okay, let's start with the fact that, that that's not true. Uh, but by now we are, of course, all familiar with the president's routine lies about things large and small, everything from Paul Manafort's role in his campaign, more on that later, to the crowd size at his inauguration. But this particular lie that the Democrats are responsible for a policy put in place by his own Department of Justice and announced by his attorney general is different because it's an attempt to deflect blame for an urgent moral crisis happening at this very moment in our country, a crisis of this president's own making that Donald Trump has admitted he intends to use as leverage to further reduce immigration to the United States and to finally get his wall, which Mexico is not going to pay for, but that he would like you to pay for, with these kids as hostages to make Congress give him the money. So here's what we know. Thanks in large part to the Trump administration's policy of tearing undocumented children away from their parents, the number of migrant children living in government shelters has now swelled to more than 11,000. Nearly 2,000 minors have been separated from their parents in the last six weeks alone, at a rate of 46 kids a day. Some of the children are as young as 10 years old, and many of the shelters used to house them, including one in Brownsville, Texas, that used to be a Walmart, are at or above capacity. To handle the overflow, the Trump administration now plans to erect a tent city in southern Texas, where temperatures are already in the 90s. Meanwhile, migrant parents are left fearing for their children and unable to help or even see them. One Democratic congresswoman visited one of the detention centers, and this is how she described the experience for migrant moms. Many of these mothers have been there in detention, various detention facilities, for over a month. Not a one of them had spoken to their children. Only two of them knew where their children were, but the rest of them had no idea where their children were. And they wept every single time they talked about their children. And they talked about how they were deceived, how their children were taken away from them through deceptions. The mothers were literally sitting in a room next to where the children were being held and could hear their children screaming, could not hug them, could not explain anything to them, and just were heartbroken. Now, it bears repeating that this is happening right now, right here in America. The question is, what are we going to do about it? Let's bring in my panel. Kate Dawson is a Republican strategist. Maria Elena Incapie is executive director of the National Immigration Law Center. And MSNBC's Jacob Soboroff visited a detention center for child migrants in Brownsville, Texas this week, has done some incredible reporting. Uh, and so I want to go to you first, Jacob. Um, tell us, you know, the experience of going through that detention center and seeing these children. Um, were you able to, to talk to kids directly? Were you allowed to talk to them and get a sense of how long it had been since they'd seen their moms and dads? Yeah, um, I had, Joy. We were asked not to, frankly. And the, and the first thing that uh, a shelter official said to us when we went inside was, uh, can you please smile at the kids? They feel like animals locked up in cages being looked at. And it was a strange thing to say because, relatively speaking, the conditions are actually pretty good there uh, in that Casa Padre shelter in Brownsville, Texas. Uh, nobody's in cages. Nobody's in fences. You got a ton of licensed uh, professional social care workers and clinicians and medical care uh, professionals because, remember, this facility was opened in 2017 to deal with a phenomenon that had been happening for a long time in the United States, unaccompanied minors coming to seek asylum and refuge uh, from Central America. The reason it's overflowing today is because of this systematic policy put into place by the Trump administration, zero tolerance to rip children apart from their families. It is a manufactured crisis. It is a self-inflicted crisis. It doesn't need to be happening. And so um, there's two groups, uh, two populations of, of young migrants in this what is really can only be called a detention uh, facility, uh, unaccompanied minors that came here on their own, and then young children that were separated from their parents. Those are the ones that are facing trauma. Those are the ones that didn't expect to be in this place. Those are the ones that expected to be with their parents when they cross the border uh, and to most of them go into the uh, asylum process. And so just to be clear, because just where you ended there, um, Jacob, these are our parents who are seeking asylum. That is the children who are in this detention center. 
Yeah, that's right. So, uh, again, unaccompanied minors, about 70% of them, come into the United States by themselves. Uh, they present to the Border Patrol. They know, whether uh, through paying a coyote who tells them uh, or some other means, that th they're going to go to a place like this. And for them, that, those 70% that are in that facility expect to be where they end up. The 30%, and that's a skyrocketing number in this facility, have no idea where they, where they were going to end up in this place. They were ripped apart by this Border Patrol policy, uh, by the CBP uh, policy that was put into place by the attorney general and the president. And by the way, it's complete BS to hear the president, the attorney general, uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders say there's nothing new about this. There's nothing unusual about it or that it's the Democrats' policy. This has never, ever been done before as a systematic policy to take kids away from their parents uh, at the rate of 100 percent is the goal of the Trump administration uh, as a matter of immigration policy. It's just never been done before. Uh, it's reminiscent of Native American children being taken away from their parents or uh, uh, children separated from from their families at Japanese uh, internment camps. This is not an immigration policy that we have seen before uh, from the federal government. Yeah, and you know, Kate, and I'll come to you on this because the, you know the talking points that the RNC is sending out um, this week um, to lawmakers and the way they want people to talk about this is to blame the Democrats. So we have the copy of the talking points here, congressional Democrats. They're trying to put it off on them, but it's clearly a policy of the Trump administration. The president has even said that he intends to use this policy as leverage to try to force Democrats to go along with a policy of reducing immigration overall and paying for the border wall. So at the end of the day, this president is not going to be able to run away from his own policy. Well, well what, what I'm seeing in the electoral space that I operate in and in the public affairs space is, 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 is a 50-year failure of both parties. So whether the DNC or the RNC want to come in, we, we've got something called illegal immigration, and that's what's in our Republican primaries now. And still a topic is illegal it's immigration. It's still the top topic in a way, it, right? It really is. I mean, it moves past jobs at certain times. <clears throat> I mean, even in South Carolina, where we don't exactly have a border anybody can cross into, right. it's a topic. And, and, and we see it very differently. When it comes to children, we, we, we understand that they need to be taken care of. We get that parents are coming here, but the key word that they're seeing electorally is they're coming here illegally. So let me ask you this question, because you, you know, um, Kate and I have to say, have been very um, outspoken and really pushed and trying to push your party to a more open, sort of open arms sure. toward other ethnic groups. You've been, you've done really, you know, good work on trying to do that, particularly in South Carolina. But when you hear people, as you said, in places where there isn't even a border, where they're not seeing this as a direct impact on their, their but they're so passionate about this issue of keeping people out, do you read that as demographic panic of saying we don't want those particular people here and we don't care if they take their kids. I don't specifically read it that way. I, I get it from especially a segment of the religious segment of our party is we're rewarding people for illegal behavior. And as they're breaking the law and we're, 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 we're not upholding the law. And then again, the law is often confused now. So I, I think where the president's going at one time, and I'm always not the defender of the president is, we got to force Congress to put something in cement about illegal immigration. And now the ugly face of it has now shown that we're having to take people who have come here well, illegally. We're not having to. Trump doesn't have to. This well, is something they've decided the, the, to do. They and, don't have to do it. They're and doing and they you and I both would come here, too, if, if, we, if we weren't here. We try to get here, too. There's nobody trying to break out of our country, and everybody's trying to break in. Yeah, these are asylum seekers. These are people running from gang violence I, I get it. and threats. And, and, so these are people we typically and, used to welcome. And me, well, we used to open all our doors to get them because we needed population. And we needed workers, we needed people from the 1920s on up. And now all of a sudden we've got this, and now we see the enormity, the public's now seeing the enormity of it when you start hearing the numbers of how many children are being brought by their parents. But the numbers are not relatively high. I mean, the, the reality is we had a much greater influx of people from Bavaria in the 1890s and right. from Ireland after the potato famine in the 1840s. It really is a particular population. You didn't see it. You, is. you did, and I, right in I the agree. 1920s, you had the same thing. We, we didn't want Asians. We didn't want people coming I from agree. North Africa. It is ethnic. And I wonder if this makes you uncomfortable. I mean, I, I want to play. Um, there was some great reporting, not only just by Jacob Soboroff. Uh, Chris Hayes has really been focusing on this, had Jacob on and spoke also with a, a whistleblower named Antar Davison, who spoke to Chris Hayes about what it's like for staff workers. One of the L.A. Times reports on him, he quit his job, and he said colleagues at a government-contracted detention center in Arizona had a specific request for Antar Davidson when three Brazilian migrant children arrived. Tell them they can't hug. The siblings, 16, 10, and 6, were distraught after being separated from their parents at the border. The children were huddled together 
tears streaming down their faces, he said. Officials had told them their parents were lost, which they interpreted to mean dead. Let me uh, let you now listen to Antar Davidson when he spoke with, uh, with Chris Hayes this week. Basic private prison model um, in the in the in the guise of this shelter. So the pe the people at the end of the day when they have to put these kids to sleep have already worked an eight hour shift are oftentimes asked to stay overtime and exhausted. And on top of that, these kids are very traumatized. They're running up and down the halls, screaming, crying for their mom, throwing chairs, right. and everyone is is it's a tired undertrained staff dealing with an increasingly traumatized and uncompliant popula uh, population of minors. I think people can't understand why Republican voters and why, as you said, this largely you know, evangelical Christian base of Trump isn't troubled by that. Well, I, I can't say they aren't troubled by the humanitarian crisis of, of what we have, but I can say that they're problematically that we have not solved the problem. We've got 1,989 miles of border. We only have 500-something miles of strategic fencing. We've still got an open southern border. We haven't done enough to secure it, and they want that problem. And that was one of the appealing things to Trump when we had 16 candidates. Even, he even stayed when we on had net migration from Mexico, we did. We did. It's, it's, we did. It's, a, it's demographic. We did. Well, let me go to Maria Elena because uh, one of the other things that Chris uh, Hayes did this week was actually to call the hotline that parents are allowed to call to try to find their kids. And this is what happened when they did that. Thank you for calling the ICE Detention Reporting and Information Line. Information you provide during this call may be transcribed and retained in our call logs. This includes names, addresses, phone numbers, other personal identifiers, vehicle information, and information related to criminal and immigration history. Additionally, ICE uses caller ID to identify your phone number and may record your phone number if it is available through caller ID. ICE may disclose the information collected during this call within the Department of Homeland Security or externally as appropriate and consistent with federal law and policy. Marielena, that is pretty chilling. If you're calling looking for your kids and you're being warned, That's anything right. you say on this call may be used to deport you. That's right. Joy, this is a horrific moment in our country. Um, this is a Trump-created moral crisis, and anyone who thinks otherwise is complicit. Um, the fact that we are having 2,000 children ripped apart from their parents, right, who um, Marco, Marco Antonio Munoz was, had a three-year-old son ripped apart from his arms. And a few weeks later, he was so desperate, and the pain from being separated from his son was so great that he committed suicide in Border Patrol custody. I mean, what we are doing to people who are seeking asylum, they have the right to seek asylum at our borders. That is how the system works. We have a domestic and international requirement to do so. They are not entering unlawfully, as the other guest just has been talking about. Um, and the fact that when you, you as a parent, are trying to find out where your, your children are and the hotline number that is given to you is about reporting yourself, basically, um, is frankly unconscionable. And I think we, we as taxpayers, we're the ones who have to have a zero-tolerance policy against this administration. Yeah, and Jacob, you know, the Daily Beast is reporting that, you know, defense contractors are now profiting off of uh, this surge in detentions. There's a company called MVM, um, and this is according to the reporting, is perhaps better known as a security contractor for U.S. intelligence. Federal contracting databases show MVM was awarded a contract worth up to $8 million over the next five years. In 2008, MVM lost a lucrative contract with the CIA in Iraq for the Wall Street Journal reported failing to provide enough armed guards. Uh, when you went down to that uh, Texas facility, who who owns it? It's a it was a Walmart, but is it is this a government contractor? Is it a private company? No, and that doesn't surprise me, Joy. The, you know, the majority of uh, ICE detention centers are also run by uh, private uh, contractors, private prisons, essentially. The, the facilities where the children are run by the Department of Health and Human Services and contracted out to nonprofits. So the owner of that building is a company called Southwest uh, Key, and th they're a nonprofit organization. One thing I do want to say, though, about this whole idea that this is a deterrence to people coming into the United States illegally, the U.S. government has tried this before. In 1994, there was an official Border Patrol policy called Prevention Through Deterrence during the Clinton administration. It built the first round of walls, fencing around urban areas. And in the document, it said, we think people are either going to stop coming or end up going in more dangerous ways where they risk their lives. Well, guess what? People didn't stop coming. They went the more dangerous ways. And the number of people dying trying to cross into the United States ended, uh, ended up going up. 
What do you think is going to happen now? People are not going to declare asylum uh, because they're scared of being separated from their children. So instead of declaring asylum, walking across the border between these ports of entry, you're going to have migrants that run from the Border Patrol with little kids in places like Aravaca, Arizona, or Ajo, Arizona, or around the Falfurrias checkpoint in southwest Te in uh, southern Texas. People are you're going to see an increase in people dying uh, trying to get into the United States, not a, a decrease in people trying to enter. They're just going to try to do it uh, a different way. It's it is an inhumane way to stop people from trying to come into the United States. Um, Kate and Dawson will be back. Uh, Maria Elena Incapie, thank you very much. Jacob Soboroff, thank you very much for your excellent reporting this week. You've been invaluable as a resource to tell us what's Thanks going on true. down there. Thank you yes, all very much. You. And up next, using religion to justify separating kids from their parents. There it Hey, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down there for more AM Joy and the rest of MSNBC. And click on any of the videos right here to watch the latest interviews and highlights. And you can get more videos from MSNBC for free every day with our newsletters. Just visit msnbc.com newsletters to sign up now.